Good morning, everybody. I'm George Latimer, Westchester County Executive, and I'm joined here by uh, the professional team, and, and it is truly a very professional team, of uh, those in our Department of Health here at our clinic in White Plains, uh, led by our Commissioner of Health, uh, Dr. Charlita Amler. And uh, I'm here to sign a bill that was passed by the Westchester County Board of Legislators a week ago, a bill that was sponsored by Legislator Alfreda Williams, who is Vice Chair of the Board. And uh, this bill will reinforce what uh, must be uh, done in this county in cases of uh, concern about communicable diseases, to give the uh, primary authority that exists and to reinforce it to the Board of Health and to uh, the Commissioner of Public Health, which are the professionals that deal with these public health issues when moments of crisis occur. Uh, in a few seconds, Dr. Amel will uh, speak, and then we'll also have uh, Vice Chair of the Board, Alfreda Williams, speak, and then Lori Smittle, who holds a doctorate in nursing and is our supervising public health nurse for clinic operations, both here and in Yonkers, uh, will also speak. We'll open it up to questions, and then uh, after we finish the formal part of the press conference, I will sign the bill, and then you're welcome to interview any of our uh, guests here one-on-one -on -one, uh, to get you know their point of view on the issue. Uh, there's been a lot of discussion and debate over the issue of vaccination and it comes out of uh, the concern about communicable diseases. This summer, uh, spring, there was an outbreak of measles, particularly significant in Rockland County and in Brooklyn. There were a few cases, I think eight cases here in Westchester County, but it became a topic of discussion. But it's not the only time that we've seen communicable diseases occur. Uh, we had an incident uh, the prior year at a restaurant in Portchester that was addressed by this health department very effectively, I might add, prior to my tenure as county executive. And uh, from time to time, uh, these things happen and, and can happen in an instant and can become a, a major public policy issue overnight. We're very fortunate to have the level of professionals that we do have. And uh, as I've mentioned, Dr. Charlita Amler serves as our commissioner of public health. She has 30 years of experience uh, in, in public health and, of course, is a medical doctor. She's a pediatrician by uh, a specialty profession. But all of the members of our uh, Department of Health have experience and, and uh, certification at various levels for different issues. Uh, our uh, Commissioner of Health and also our Board of Health have broad powers and responsibilities to protect us from diseases. And the bill that I'm signing today reinforces that. The Board of Legislators, uh, Alfreda Williams, and she's going to be joined by her colleague, uh, Legislator J uh, Mary Jane Shimsky, uh, who is uh, just with us now. Mary Jane, would you join us over here, please? Happy to have you here. The Board of Legislators discussed this issue in light of the summertime issues that occurred and determined that they wanted to make sure that the policy was reinforced, that in times of crisis, in times where there's deep concern about the communicability of a disease, that it is the professionals, the Board of Health, the Commissioner of the Department of Health, and, and all of the professionals that back her up, that make these policy decisions. It may be unusual for you to see uh, a county executive talk about uh, reducing their authority or power. Most people think that never happens in government or politics. But there are times when the professional skill that exists in this county government has to override the political leadership of the county. And although we go before the electorate and, and we ask for and we exert the authority of our position, at various times the Board of Legislators as well as the County Executive have to stand down in a matter particularly of crisis where it's professional uh, knowledge and ability that should make the public policy decisions at hand. That's what uh, Legislator Williams's legislation does. It reflects that wisdom that, that tells us that there is a time for those of us who debate public policy to debate it, but when it comes time to implementing that public policy, we have to turn to the professionals who understand these things, have spent their life working in the area of, of health and public health, who interact with the public on matters of public health, who deal with people uh, in all various stages of circumstances, people with compromised immune systems, women who are pregnant, women who have newborns with them, uh, people uh, of advanced age, all across the spectrum. Those types of decisions in that type of a crisis environment need to be made by the Commissioner of Health, a person who has the skill necessary to perform that function, by the Board of Health, people that are appointed by the Board of Legislators, not by the County Executive. That's one of the boards and commissions for which the legislature makes those decisions. And having served in that very legislature for many years, many times it's the wisdom of having a multiple number of decision makers to fill a board that is the best way to get the type of diversity. And so I think I'm very 
very happy as a county executive to defer some of that power because it's the right thing to do. And, uh, and I know Dr. Ambler will address this, but let's understand what this is not. This is not a debate over vaccinations. This is not the expansion of vaccinations. People who are out there who hold certain philosophical beliefs will interpret any action in this area as being that, but that is not what this does. And I invite anybody to get the actual law, the actual law that Legislator Williams presented that was voted on unanimously by the board, bipartisanly by the board, read it, and you'll see very clearly what it does and what it doesn't say. So I'm going to defer now, as I will in matters of crisis, to Dr. Amler so that she can uh, share some of her professional point of view. Then we'll be followed by Vice Chair Legislator Williams, who will uh, comment on her legislation that was passed. And then we're going to ask uh, Lori Smittle to comment uh, from her operational standpoint. So next, Dr. Amler. Thank you. So good morning. I want to first of all start by thanking the county executive and the board of legislators uh, for enacting this um, new bill. And I also want to thank Alfreda Williams. Alfreda is not only a board of legislator, but she has served on the board of health for many years. So she has firsthand experience with uh, the things that go on within our board. And we're very lucky that we have a very strong board of health within this county. Some of our members who serve without pay have been on that board for more than 30 years. So they are a very strong board and they really care about public health. So what does this, this new bill do? It basically gives the health department greater ability in preventing disease when outbreaks occur in a timely manner. Because when you have an outbreak, time really does matter. It allows us to be proactive and not have to wait before, uh, for the county to declare a state of emergency before that we can take action when we have an emerging infectious disease. The recent measles outbreaks that occurred not only in Westchester but in Rockland and Orange County, several other counties in the state of New York, New York City, um, they really brought to light some of the shortcomings that we had in our own code uh, that prohibited not just me, but our Board of Health from taking action in a timely manner. And this bill will hopefully correct that. With public health, we're all about preventing disease. It's always better to not have to treat someone for a disease if you're able to prevent that disease from ever occurring. And one of the tools, one of the many tools we have in, that we use to prevent disease is immunization. This bill does not mandate or will not mandate that you have an immunization. What it will help us do is sometimes people may work in professions that if they have a disease, could a vaccine preventable disease, could allow that disease to be unknowingly spread to others. And if we're aware of that through our investigations, because every time there is an outbreak in this, um, in this county of a communicable disease, we have many staff, part of whom are behind me now, who look into where did this disease come from? How was it transmitted? Who might have been exposed? What can we do to prevent those people who were exposed from exposing, developing the disease or exposing others? So part of the investigation that we have is where do you work? What do you do? Who, how might you spread this to other people? And certainly if we had individuals who had been exposed, um, we would, in, in a workplace environment, we would not want others uh, to then um, carry that on. So what, it might, what might happen is that we might have an instance where we would have to say to people who were in a work environment, you need to work here uh, until this is under control, uh, you would need to be vaccinated to continue to function in the job that you're in. Um, or other such circumstances. So as I said, this law is really all about preventing disease, about being proactive. It's about limiting the spread of disease when it happens. It's really about protecting the public. It's about protecting your families, protecting my family, protecting the community that we all serve. And the people standing behind me are the ones who make this happen every single day. Um, we do vaccine related clinics every Friday for those individuals who have no health insurance or their health insurance does not cover vaccines. They can come to this clinic or to the clinic in Yonkers and receive vaccines free of charge. That's not just children. We also vaccinate adults. 
and it's a wide range of vaccines. And so once vaccinated, hopefully, then that individual will never get that disease. Um, I want to bring up one other thing, and that is that we are approaching flu season. And uh, flu vaccine, although not related to this bill, I think it's a perfect opportunity to say that we would encourage everyone to get their flu vaccine. Um, many people get flu every year. And unfortunately, there's already been one pediatric death in this country related to flu um, this season. So um, we do also give flu vaccines in our clinics. So I just want to thank again, thank the county executive, thank the board of legislature uh, for their assistance in making this happen and for helping us protect the citizens that we all serve. So thank you. Next, we're going to hear from uh, the author of this bill in the legislature, uh, Legislator Alfreda Williams, who is vice chair of the board. Uh, she represents uh, parts of Greenberg, uh, the city of White Plains, village of Sleepy Hollow, I believe the village of Tarrytown and Elmsford. Uh, she served on the board uh, with great distinction over a number of years. And she, along with Mayor Jane Shimsky and the other colleagues, uh, uh, passed Legislator Williams's bill unanimously. So Alfreda, please come and share your thoughts as the bill sponsor. Good morning. It really is a pleasure for me to stand here before you today and indicate and tell you how pleased I am that this legislation has passed. It's something that is terribly, terribly necessary and provides our health department with the ability to get out in front of unsuspected outbreaks of infectious disease, especially when they appear to be happening more frequently now. The changes in the law will give our public health officials the legal resources they need to act quickly and effectively and to keep Westchester residents safe. We all think of the diseases as some not necessarily dangerous diseases that often are associated with childhood illnesses and so on. But it is important today that we understand and really look at what is happening nationwide in our country. Infectious disease are becoming more prevalent and more dangerous, and Westchester County is taking the lead on this, and I'm extremely pleased that Dr. Ambler and the Board of Health had proposed this, and I was extremely pleased to support it. So I think we need to get on with the work at hand. Thank you. Thank you. Our uh, next speaker is Lori Smittle, who is the supervising public health nurse for clinic operations. As I mentioned, we have public clinic here in White Plains. We have one in Yonkers. Uh, Lori has overall responsibility for it. She is a professional in the field of nursing, holds a doctorate of nursing, and uh, has been involved, uh, as we've done any number of initiatives, uh, bringing a very practical-minded implementation to these things. So, Lori, please share your thoughts. Good morning. <laughs> um, Thank you again to the Board of Legislators, Board of Health, Dr. Amler, my esteemed colleagues, and of course, Mr. George Latimer. Um, as nurses, we're all about prevention, and this bill will help us to prevent an outbreak by allowing us to react very quickly um, to an emergency situation. We would encourage the public to check with their primary health care provider to make sure that everyone has their necessary vaccinations. Um, if you're unsure, you can call us. We, as was previously mentioned, the Westchester County Health Department does offer immunization clinics here uh, for the un- or underinsured, but would encourage anyone to call us with any questions. Thank you. Before you open it up to questions, just one sort of symbolic comment to try to drag this together. It may seem like a bit of a non sequitur. But um, uh, my father uh, lived to the age of 82, passed away uh, through a combination of illnesses that took his life. The last uh, week of his life, he was in uh, the medical center here in Westchester County, where he got high quality medical care. And during that period of time, my sister and I visited him uh, nightly to see how dad was doing. And of course, we lost him, which happens to all of us in our family. But during that period of time, I put my faith not in a personal ideology, 
not in uh, whatever I thought I had learned in my career in public or private uh, business, but I put my faith in the healthcare professionals that were doing everything they could to save his life. And more often than not, it were the nurses that I spoke to, the nurses who were on duty. And, and they tried to provide information and comfort to a family member. They do it every day, depending on where you practice your craft. And the medical doctors who are here amongst us do the same thing at the front end of life, when a new child is born, and uh, all throughout your life. Whenever you have an ache and pain, we all understand this. Uh, I was at a public press conference uh, where we were showing off uh, a new um, blood pressure device in, uh, in Yonkers, and I tested my own blood pressure. It was sky high, and all of a sudden, I wasn't a county executive. I was just an overweight old guy that got scared <laughs> pretty fast. Went to my medical doctor, we did a bunch of tests. I wasn't in as bad shape as I thought I was. But what it tells you, in moments of personal crisis, you stop thinking about all this other stuff, and you look in the eyes of these people, and you ask yourself, can I trust them with my father's life? Can I trust them with my own life? Can I trust them with making decisions that aren't based on the color of your skin, isn't based on your gender, but is based on the knowledge that they've accumulated over time? I did that for my father, and I did that for myself. So why wouldn't I, as county executive, sign a bill that gives these people the right to make those decisions when the county is in crisis. That is simply what this bill is. And I'm now going to sign it into law. So we'll open it up to questions from the press, uh, which any of us, they can be directed to any of us as you see fit. And then uh, after we do general questions, then we'll uh, stay here because you're probably going to get the question. <laughs> you're probably going to have to answer the question. All right, so our friends in the press, any questions that you may have? If there are no general questions, then we'll leave it open to individual interviews. You're welcome to interview Dr. Amler or, uh, or uh, Lori. Do I call you doctor? Doctor. Lori. Lori is mine. Lori the doctor. How about that? Or <laughs> legislator um, Williams or any of the other folks here. Dr. Amler, how much was a hindrance? On mic. If you want to call it a hindrance, was the, the law as it currently exists for you a hindrance to your well, um, this kind of all came about because this summer we were facing a question of what were we going to do with our summer camps if there was still measles cases within Westchester. And you saw what Ro happened in Rockland and Orange. We did not have the ability to do that. We could not, we could not say to the individuals working, even if we had a case of measles in the camp, we wouldn't have been able to say to them, you know, you cannot, you cannot be here. Um, if you are not vaccinated or we could have tried to we could have tried to leverage it but we wanted actually to have it in law so that when we said you know you must if you are going to work in this camp you must be vaccinated um, because we have an outbreak of measles in our community uh, we wanted that to be soundly grounded in the law and so that's what this does so let's say if measles persists uh, we get we get people from all over the world who come here to working in camps over over the summer and some of them come from countries where diseases are are rampant and where immunizations are not given uh, and so if they come in and they've not been vaccinated and they bring their diseases you know with them so to speak um, they have the ability to spread disease within this community that's basically kind of what happened uh, with the whole measles outbreak. We had someone coming in from out of the country who came in and brought measles with them. And Rock Rockland has had hundreds of cases of measles. We've had eight cases. 
New York City's had a number of cases in the Brooklyn area. Uh, there have been cases in uh, a number of states across the country. So shouldn't we have the ability to say, if you're coming in from a country where disease is prevalent and you're going to work in our community, we want to know that you're not going to bring diseases with you, that you're going to come in and, be, and our community is going to be safe. Um, in the camps, sometimes there are people in the camps, children in the camps, who cannot be vaccinated. Even if their parents want to, they can't vaccinate them. They might have some kind of immune compromising disease. They might have cancer. And for them, a vaccine is not possible. And so if the parents can't feel safe that their child is in a safe environment, the kids don't get to go to camp. That's just an example. Besides the camp, is there another loophole that your plan is now fixed? Well, I, I think if we were to have another major outbreak of hepatitis A, we certainly then would have the ability to say, you know, if you're going to be serving food in, uh, in this particular restaurant or this particular area where we have known cases of hepatitis A, you must be vaccinated. I mean, I think that people who go into restaurants basically have the, they have an assurance or they feel they have an assurance um, that the people who are serving the food are not carrying some kind of communicable disease and that the food is safe to eat. I don't think that's an unreasonable assumption. So. so the law as it currently stands now does not, I'm sorry, as it was before, didn't contain that provision? If there was an outbreak, if there was a, a which we try to stay ahead of outbreaks, you know, that's our whole point. <laughs> but if, let's just say, for example, if there was an outbreak of hepatitis A, we did not have the authority to say every food handler in the area must be vaccinated. And, um, and so sometimes when you get into certain outbreak situations where you know you have disease and you know that certain people are placing the public at risk, it would at least allow the Board of Health to make a decision regarding that. This bill doesn't dictate anything in regards to immunizations. What it does is it allows the Board of Health in consultation with the, the people who know the circumstances to make a decision around what is best to serve the public, to protect the public in whatever situation we find ourselves. Let me just add something to that as well. I think it's important. Uh, this legislation, I think, and Alfreda referenced it, and if you were to watch the debate or the discussion that occurred in committee at the Board of Legislators, it, was, it came out of the assessment of what happened this summer. So when, without a crisis like that, and we didn't have the brunt of it, we saw it play out in Rockland and Brooklyn. And so the board, to their credit, tried to be uh, in the same way that you are, preventative, to look at what could happen in the future. And it, it's when you have a test that you didn't expect that you look at a system and you say, we didn't realize we couldn't do that, and we ought to, we ought to sort of plug that loophole, or we ought to refine what we're doing. So this really is an outgrowth of the assessment of what happened uh, in the summertime, and I think it's a it, frankly, it's a good example of legislation, not where you're reacting to, uh, you know, a popular cry to do this or that, but it's a thoughtful analysis months after a crisis. What could we do better? That was the genesis for this legislation mm -hmm. and for the reason for us doing it now. Do you know how long it was on the books as it was at passing? Since time began. <laughs> uh, you know, as far as we know, Michelle, uh, it, it, it's, it's almost like you don't look at a section of pipe in your basement until it starts to leak. If you ask me, when did I last look at that pipe in my basement, I'd say, I, I don't know. Maybe when I bought the house, maybe not. When it starts to leak, you fix it. You say, hey, I realize now I've got to replace that pipe. And that's really the genesis for what, what happened here. Yes, it was a unanimous decision. I'm grateful to my colleagues for realizing the need for this, and as I say, it was unanimous. Thank you. Mm -hmm. And you know, one other thing I would add is that I think we've seen this over and over again with public health. New diseases come to the fro. We don't even know what diseases may be a problem for us in the future. I have no idea. You know, uh, I mean, they just pop up sometimes and and then you're dealing with that that crisis at the moment and as long as there is some medication a, a vaccine that can prevent a disease it's always something that we have to consider among many other things i just it just gives us the ability to use the tools that we have and 
And the key here is in a timely manner. Because once you have disease, if I have to wait three months or longer to be able to put measures into place, it can really get away from you. And so this gives us the ability to respond in a timely manner when the need arises. And I think that's, the, that's really the key message here. Timely manner when the need arises. Joe, yes. Final question. You said you don't have a problem in decreasing your power as it were. Yep. That's true. And I think it, it, it comes from a, a rational assessment that there are times uh, in the responsibilities that I have as county executive that a department head or a department has specific expertise that those of us in the general management of the county do not have. There are people in this county who are professional managers of a correctional facility. I have never had that personal experience. When they come with advice and there's decisions that have to be made in a moment's notice, it, it may very well be, having given broad-based direction, that, that it's the commissioner or the people below the commission that should be able to make the decisions on how to handle that situation. We have an emergency services department. They could handle a crisis such as something at Indian Point. And if it happens at a certain time of the day or night, we expect those professionals to be ready to make the decisions or advise on the decisions. So I think, it, I think it's just looking at government in a more pragmatic way. I come out of a business background with all of the positions I've held in public office. And in business, my, my expertise was in marketing and sales. And there were other people in the executive team that had experience in operations and finance and security. And we made decisions jointly, each contributing our expertise. I'm trying to take that same mindset into the management of the county. It's only 21 months, so I'm not you know, a multiple year experienced county executive. But it seems to me on an issue like this, you defer to professionals and you let professional advice drive the policy. And particularly when you're, because this is all pivoted around what happens in a crisis? In a crisis where minutes count, where it's not the opportunity to deliberate over a long period of time, who do you, who do you task with making those decisions? And in this particular case, we task professionals who are properly trained to be able to make those decisions. That's the thinking behind uh, you know, uh, my support of this. So, now I know, Allie, you probably have some questions you want to ask. I think I'm obliged to let all these young ladies behind me go from the attention position back to a normal life. And but so we'll do we any other interviews them. you want. We should thank them okay. and let the thank public you very know much. that we really have a very dedicated group of professionals.